Welcome back to another episode of the Recruitment Mentors Podcast. I'm your host, Hisham Aziz, and in this week's episode, I sat down with Karen Deep Sohil, who is the founder of a company called Pivot Search. It was the first person we had from a Leeds in the podcast studio. And after a decade of working for other people, Karen Deep, over the last two years, has been on a journey in building his very own recruitment business. And the real theme of this episode, which I absolutely loved and dug into a lot of detail on, is why Karen Deep is so passionate about building a recruitment business that prioritizes its people over profits. The cynicals out there will say, what you're on about, you need to be making money and those things. And uh, absolutely. And I really go into detail with Karen Deep about what does that actually mean, prioritizing people over profits? What does that look like within the company? What are some of the things that he's investing in? How is he supporting his teams? And how is that impacting performance? Are they making more money? Are they performing better? We discuss it all in this episode, and I really hope you enjoy it. Karen Deep, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me, Hisham. Thank you so much for uh, making the trip uh, from Leeds. Yep. Again, we had, last time I was in here, we had the first Irishman in, in the studio. Now we've got the first Yorkshire. Well, good to be representing the North. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So really excited for this. I guess just to frame it up for everyone listening, when we're just talking about this. So you've had a really long time in the recruitment industry, yep. over a decade before you started your own sort of entrepreneurial journey. So we are going to touch a little bit on, I guess, what you learned in that period. But we're really going to focus on today your journey as a recruitment entrepreneur. Uh, building your your recruitment business pivot and really talk about the things that you're passionate about and, and why you're really committed to building a recruitment business that's that's genuinely different yeah. so i guess where i always like to start though is is the million pound question the question that you've probably really thought long and hard about when hiring for your business so i'd love to hear sort of your thoughts and takes on what you believe make up a highly successful recruitment consultant in today's market the traits the the common uh, things that you see in uh, successful people mm-hmm. today Cool. I think it's a really interesting question to start with, but also, you know, there's the stereotypical answers that you expect, you know, you're looking for somebody driven, committed, tenacious, resilient, you know, you hear those words all the time. But for me, it's actually, I think the, the thing that differentiates good recruiters from the average or the very good from the good is actually mindset and attitude mm. and ambition. And what you find, what I find is that I consider myself a successful recruiter, but I've also managed a lot of successful recruiters in the past and still do. And I think, yes, they have those traits, but what makes them different is mindset and attitude. And I think the thing that stands out is a lot of very good recruiters know what they want to achieve and then have the reason behind it. And what Mm. you find is what they want to achieve is quite ambitious. It tends to reflect what is actually the best version of themselves, what is the best of me. And that's where they set the benchmark. That's what I want to achieve. And they're very committed, determined, and that's what I want to achieve. When you start to talk to them, they have a reason why, and the why is always different. You know, traditionally, a lot of people tell you, well, people just do recruitment for money. Well, you know, yeah, they do, but there are other reasons. You get to understand why. And suddenly, what you find is with the more successful recruiters, they have a very clear picture of what they want to achieve. They have a good reason why they go, they're quite ambitious and driven. They want to do it. And your job as a leader is actually to do the how. Mm, you know, I love that. You're there to give them the resources, the tools, the advice, the support, you know, the shoulder to do that. But ultimately, the bit that you find very difficult to influence is the what do you want to achieve and why. I think a lot of recruitment leaders just walk out of target meetings going, yeah, look, we've got them hyped up. They want to achieve this. They walk out and go, no, actually, I don't want, I've got no yeah, real surface, buy-in. It's surface. surface. They walk out and it disappears. But the really good people are telling you, this is what I want to achieve. This is why I want to do it. Mm. You give me the how. And that's the difference. Having those people who quite clearly know what they want to achieve. They're focused, ambitious, mm. and they really want to do it. That's the difference. You've really got to believe in what you want to achieve and why you want to do it. And what you find is a large percentage of the time, they go on to do that because they're driving it, not being told. I love that. So just on this very quickly, I'm I'm interested to get your thoughts on this. So like you said, as a leader, you'd struggle to influence the the why and and the the sort of picture of what they want to achieve. And your job there is to, yeah, facilitate the how and and educate on that. 
So I guess for people listening, and I don't know if you did this for yourself and maybe you help your, your team now, but like what good quality questions can we ask ourselves to unpack that and uncover uh, what the sort of why is or what it is that we want to achieve? Because I think a lot of these things can come from good questions and asking yeah. ourselves good questions. So what might be some, some good questions that we can ask ourselves that can help us arrive at what is it that, that I want and, and why? I think the key to it is not sitting in a meeting and presenting those questions. Like you can mm. into a meeting going, right, Isham, what do you want to achieve? Yeah. Because you're going to get a surface level answer that hasn't had much thought. What you actually want to do is empower your consultants and make sure you're prepping them for the times you want to take time out to understand what they want to achieve. Give them sort of questions. What, you know, asking them, what do you really want to achieve? Um, ask them why, what, what are the drivers, but then actually go on to say, I don't just want you to write down what you're trying to achieve. I actually want you to go away, write down what you want to achieve, but what does it look like? What visually, you know, you achieving your goals, what does it look like? But then go deeper. What does it feel like? Because once, you know, only something like 5% of people achieve their targets if they just write them down. Something like 25 to 30% of people achieve their targets if they visualize them. What does it look like? But it's something like 60 to 70% of people achieve their targets when they can actually write them down, picture them, and feel the emotion of achieving that target. That's actually getting an emotional buy-in. Um, and that isn't just coming from me making that up. We've actually worked, um, part of our development program is working with one of the best um, coaches who's worked with some amazing sports stars, businesses on achieving the best in yourself. And to achieve the best in yourself, you have to, you don't have to just write it. It's about writing it, seeing, seeing it, it, feeling it. it. And that. that is how you do it. So it's difficult to say what particular questions you no, should no, be No, no, I think asking. you've answered that. It's like, I think a good framework there is, yeah, firstly, what is it that you, you want? visually what what is it that you did that you yeah you see happening or how you want to see it and then yeah the important question of like how's that going to make you feel i think that's a, a great little framework that I, people can use but i think the bit that i'd add is you've got to take away the fear of consultants coming in or employees coming in and telling you what you they feel you want to hear right you've got yeah. to let them say there are no boundaries there are no parameters of you've got to stay in this you know you should feel comfortable saying whatever reason. People may have the most ridiculous things of what they want to achieve and why they want to, but they shouldn't feel, you know, embarrassed or feared coming into a meeting to tell you, you know, if that's what drives them, great. You know, they shouldn't feel like, well, can't say that or, or I'm not or sure what they'll think. things that you want to hear. Yeah. That's a great point. Thank you for adding that. Okay, so I guess I, I just have one question for you. A lot of recruiters listen to this who are aspiring to be in the top 10% of their business want to have the best possible recruitment career they can so obviously before you started pivot you worked um for um a couple of different brands over over just over a decade and from what i saw on on linkedin on both occasions you got to the head of position so i guess in hindsight what i'd just be good just to get your thoughts on an anecdote on is like looking back what is it that you think that you did uh, that enabled you to to get to that point and i guess just any sort of thoughts or um notes on for people listening to this who really want to maximize the opportunity they have in an employer that's going to give them the progression opportunities that could enable them to get to that head of position uh, for people listening yeah so thoughts on how how can people really maximize the opportunity they have in a recruitment company and how you think you did that i think that probably the first thing i'd talk about is actually don't be afraid to be pushed out of your comfort zone when i first stepped into management um what probably just over 10 years ago, it came about in a real unexpected fashion. Um, it's quite a funny story. My manager at the time was working for a business that wasn't particularly performing well. My manager went into a management meeting, was supposed to go out on a work football trip, taking the team to Germany. CEO asked him, do you really think you should be going? And he ummed and went, yeah, I think we should go. And CEO obviously thought differently and decided that's it, it's time for a management change. <laughs> and came to me and said, well, I want you to head up that oil and gas division mm. and sat there looking going, well, shit, I don't, I've not managed before. I'm two, three years into my career, you know, and it's not, I wouldn't say it's necessarily been a lightning start to recruitment, but I was pushed out of my comfort zone and given the reassurance that actually you can do it, give it a go. What, what is the worst 
that can, that can happen, you yeah. know. And I think that is really important that at times you'll be pushed out of your comfort zone. I think you've got to take those opportunities, but also on the proviso that there is the support and reassurance there that actually, yet yeah, we're pushing you out, but we will support you. We will make it as comfortable as experience as possible. And I think don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone is really important, but also you've got to embrace change, evolution. You've got to be flexible. You know, the longer you're stuck in your ways and fail to adapt to the team that you're managing, the people that you're managing, the harder it is. Because one thing I've found is you've constantly got to be thinking about, well, what's working? Right. That's brilliant. But what, not necessarily what's not working, but what could I, what can we do better? How can yeah. we evolve to continue moving forward? And I think that's got to be the mindset of a good manager, a good leader is somebody who is prepared to try things, but also prepared to accept that not everything you try is going to work. So how do you make it work? You don't give up on it. Um, I'd say they're really important traits that have helped me get to where I am. Yeah, um, and also, I think it's really important to, to listen to the people around you, not just the people above you, but the people that you manage. You've got to really understand your team. And I think probably in the last, I'd say, certainly in the last couple of years of Pivot, you was actually a core value of ours, but the length to which I actually understand my staff, get to know my staff, helps me actually manage them so that they get the best out of themselves. So, you know, don't think that as a manager, as a leader, it's just about shouting orders out and actually handing out tasks and telling people to do things. It's also about understanding your team and understanding they are individuals and fact working out how do you get the best out of different people because there is definitely no one size fits all policy. No, I love that. Some great things in there. So yeah, le leaning into getting out of your comfort zone, leaning into opportunities that you get given and sort of trusting that you'll, uh, yeah, hopefully thrive or at least, yeah, lean into the opportunities that you get. Yeah, I love the point around uh, just, yeah, being really open-minded to how you've done things in the past and how things could maybe evolve and change. And uh, yeah, just just be a really good listener and I guess just don't think you know it all. Yep. So yeah, I love that. So I guess let, let's go into your entrepreneurial journey then. So I guess what what where I'd like to start is because look, I know how passionate you are about building a brand that's genuinely different. Okay. And I guess where I wanted to start was a lot of people start their recruitment businesses by saying, we're going to do it differently. How many people actually do it differently? I'm not sure. Very, very few. Yeah. So <laughs> I, w I wanted to just get your first take on like, again, just thinking about your past experiences. What is it that you took from those experiences? Um, pros and cons that you're like, right, I'm going to take these parts. I'm not going to do these parts. And these are the things that I'm going to make sure I deliver on in, in Pivot and why. I think obviously a lot of people will take all the different experiences and say, you know what, I really like what they did there. I'm definitely not going to do that. So just, just keen to get your initial thoughts when you thought about your business. What were the things that you were really going to commit to? Um, and what are the things that you, you definitely wanted to avoid? And, and it'd be just good to understand why uh, that you would have taken from these different experiences that you had. I think the big commitment from my side was I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a di genuinely different search firm and I am going to do it. And I think the most important thing is that it comes from the leadership. It comes from me. If I don't champion it, if I don't embrace it, I don't practice it, it won't happen. Um, and I think the other important thing for me was, I, I, as well as taking the good bits, and I think that's something that I've done probably certainly over the last six, seven, eight years, is actually work out what are the good bits, what are the bits worth keeping, what are the bits worth investing in and making better. But I think probably what's more influential is learning People talk about learning from my mistakes, but I'd actually talk about learning more from my experiences. I worked in recruitment 15 years ago when, you know, it was a very stereotypical industry. You know, people wore the three-piece suits, their pinstripe suits. It was a bit boiler room, Wolf of Wall Street, sure. micromanaged, blanket KPIs. And you've got to learn from that, that experience and go, well, what doesn't work and I think that's got to be a big driver is not looking at what the mistakes that I made but what was it I didn't like mm. what what was it that do you know what in the modern day workplace doesn't work and so what were some of those things there um I'd say micromanagement yeah um you know every, and micromanagement's just blanket KPIs everybody has to do the same number of e-shots everybody has to make the same number of calls we used to have phone times when I first started mm. um 
which to be honest were the biggest waste of time ever because the people at the top you know got a bottle of wine at the end of each week but also people were sat ringing the talking clock or their mum on a Friday afternoon just to get to that yeah. level. But I think the big things are that there was a big culture where people, or sorry, employees of the business were just treated like revenue generating cogs in a machine. They weren't treated as people. And I think it's really, really important to treat people as people, value them as people. You know, there wasn't a culture or a mentality to be able to talk about mental health. There certainly was no support for mental health at that point or consideration for it. It was literally you come to work, do the job or you get shouted at. Um, there, there wasn't an investment in technology. There wasn't, you know, it, there was zero flexibility. You know, you worked 60, 70 hour weeks. And do you know what? If you didn't cut the mustard, you were made to feel like shit. And openly in front of the office, you'd be chastised. And, you know, all of that experience, you look at it and go, well, I went through that and do you know what? It, it wasn't good for me. It wasn't good for many people in the business. It certainly didn't bring the best out of people. So they're the things that I'm going to push out. And also the way that businesses were led, you know, and I think still to this day, there are businesses like that where, you know, the recruitment owners cream the profits. They drive around in the Ferraris and, you know, the people in the, at the top of the business get the holidays and the incentives. But do you know what? The people who are doing well, achieving what they should be achieving in the middle of, are left and forgotten. And you talk to people in these businesses and they're like, you know, blanket KPIs, micromanagement still exist. And do you know what? People love you if you hit your targets and you're doing well. But if not, you're made to feel like dirt and you could be the top biller in the business, but you might have missed target last month or blank last month and you're still made to feel like crap. It's a very short-termistic view of managing people. I think the way that I manage now is largely influenced by the things that previous leaders and managers did badly as opposed to did well. Thank you for sharing that. So I guess this is, this. Is, let, let's start then with, obviously you've got it um, on your website, you obviously make it very clear on, on LinkedIn around the, you very much, like you said, value people mm. over profit. So let, let's just, obviously, I, I do feel like, and I, and I told you about this, that there's some more and more, I feel, recruitment companies are, um, are leading with that approach. Some people were cynical about it um, in terms of hearing that. It's like, okay, what do you actually do? So I guess it'd be good just to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, when you actually say that, how does that actually manifest in your business and in the context of a recruitment business? When you say we value people over profit, what does that actually mean? Give us some examples of you, yeah, the things that you, you think that sort of really demonstrate that. I think to start with, from the leadership, you've got to buy into... Yeah, you've got to believe but it. You've got to it, believe, yeah. live and it's breathe It's got to come it. through you. It's authentic. Yeah. It can't just be like, we're doing this because it's going to make us different. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. There's a lot of businesses that market themselves as something. You go work for them and they're not. Mm. So that's rule number one. You actually practice what you preach. You say what you do And that's got to come tip. from you the leadership team, everyone, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but the way that we've broken it down is I, I looked at, uh, the first question I asked myself is, you know, before I look at what I want to change, why do I want to change it? Because for me, it's time for recruitment to evolve, break the stereotypes, the stigmas that we've just talked about that still exist. And I think the first thing to do is a change of mindset as a leader. A lot of recruitment leaders are fixated on where people work, when people work. Um, and for me, we've moved away from that. My mindset is actually on the deliverables. Let's look at what people want to achieve. My conversation with any consultant joining the business um, at the beginning of the year, at the half point of the year, what do you want to achieve? And, you know, there's got to be a mutuality agreement that we want to achieve below, above a certain point. But ultimately, you know, once you tell me you want to achieve that, I'm actually fixated on helping you achieve that. I'm not fixated on where you work, when you work, what you do with your working day. So flexibility is a massive thing for me. So we operate a system of working when you want to work. So that's seven days a week. You can work when you want. If you prefer to work on a Sunday as opposed to Friday, go do it, you know where you work, does it matter whether you're working in an office, does it matter whether you're working from home, 
does it matter that you're working from a coffee shop? You could be working on holiday, you know. I, I had somebody ask me, well, I want to go to South America if I get a, a um, Airbnb, can I work from South America for three months? And I said, well, you know, as long as you are, realize you are working, go for it, you know, and why, why should it matter when you work, the hours you work? You know, it should actually be about the deliverables. It should be certainly about the fact that let's focus on you achieving what you want to achieve and move away from being fixated on those things. Um, I think innovation is really, really important. And I'd start by talking innovatively managing people. You know, the way in which I believe is the right way to doing things is giving people, you know, trust, autonomy, flexibility, which th are three of our core values and, and living by them. So I catch up with people on a Monday and I want to catch up with them as a person, not what business have you got, what revenues coming in, what are you doing this week in terms of KPIs? How's your weekend? What have you been up to? I actually want to understand people. It enables you to support people if you actually can engage with them. And then, you know, what do you want to achieve for the week? Right, my job's to support you, but I'm going to let you go get on with it. But I'm here to support you, whether it's something little, you know, you might be frustrated with the search and, you know, you're at the end of your tether with it. Just all you need to do is drop me a message and go, Kaz, can I have some help with this? It could be a bigger issue. It could be, you know, a process that's got issues. It could be a client that's been difficult, you know, but you've got to be approachable as a manager. But what you find is that if people are approaching you for a call and saying this, it actually matters to them. And you're not having to micromanage the hell out of them. I don't, there is no benefit in me ringing them every morning, every afternoon. You know, a lot of those meetings are pointless. We don't do them. And I find people are more productive. From an innovative perspective, I really want to move forward instead of, you know, traditionally when consultants position themselves to clients and candidates, how are you a specialist? Oh, well, I've placed with companies A, B and C and um, I've filled roles X, Y and Z. I can't put them together for confidentiality and also they're a bit made up. Whereas I actually want to change the way that recruiters market themselves and make them genuine key people of in influence. influence. Yeah. And the way you that requires an investment. It comes back to prioritising people over profits. You can't prioritise people without compromising something, and that's profitability, because I'm investing in them and putting money into them. So making people key people of influence where they're genuinely increasing their credibility, their visibility, their reputation in the market. So when the client says, well, how are you a key person of influence? Well, let me show you some of the marketing collateral that I've produced in your market, talking to your peers, your competitors, people in your business about what's going in your market. I can genuinely show that I'm deeply embroiled in the market and people in the market, directors, VPs, senior level management, are prepared to create collateral, put their name, put their company's name to it. And that's how I'm a key person of influence, you know, as opposed to the answer that you've been taught for 10, 15 years. Mm. Um, but also making sure that people have the tools. You know, we are a smaller business, but I'm not afraid to invest in tech as long as it has a reason, it has a purpose and it adds value. So one of the ways that we've really maximized this is by partnering with businesses instead of you're a supplier to me, you supply product X, Y, and Z, that's it. We actually treat our suppliers as partners. We'll work with them to maximize the benefit and they're deeply bought into us because you know, we'll provide them all the testimonials in the world because they're doing a great job for us. But equally as much, they're helping the consultants maximise it. So having a tech stack that actually delivers value internally and externally is how we're innovative. Um, and I think the other piece that is really important is that we've created a culture and an environment that really embraces mental health. Um, you know, it's not just about providing support. You've got to have an environment where... Employees feel comfortable talking about mental health. You know, recruitment puts a lot of strain on you and you are a person, not an employee. You know, there are things going on at home in people's lives that have a massive strain on the mental health. They can't have a button or a switch that turns it off when they walk in the office. And we've created an environment where if you talk about mental health, I'm not saying openly to the whole business on Slack, I'm having a tough time, but come to me and talk about mental health. I'm not going to put a mark against their name and go, oh shit, you know what, well, we're gonna have to manage them, them out. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna have to watch out. It's actually right. 
Let's help them. Let's support them. Let's, you know, give them the empathy that they deserve and understanding that, you know, there's things going on. How can I help you? How can I support you? But going on beyond that, we actually use a third party partner who is an employee well-being practitioner. They provide confidential advice. People can ring them. I don't necessarily know who rings them unless people tell me. And they have professional advice. So sometimes it gets to a point where people come to me and I'm pushing them on saying, I don't know quite what the answer is. And I don't, I think it's too important to second guess the answer. Go on to our mental health practitioner, speak to them, talk to them. Don't worry, we'll, we'll pay for that. But I want to make sure you're okay. But it all starts from having that culture. It's okay to not be okay. It's sure. okay to talk about mental health. And I think what we've done is we've packaged it up as an employee offering that isn't just about, you know, flexibility, that isn't just about innovation, that isn't about well-being. It's actually about a complete employee offering without compromise. You know, the other thing we had to think about is people do the job for money. We wanted to have the strongest commission structure that's actually achievable, that isn't just on paper looks good, but impossible to achieve in practice. So that is how we are different that we offer a lot to employees but they know they're not compromised they can literally achieve more money with pivot than they can anywhere else right so let's a couple of things we want to go into thank you for sharing all that so i want to i just the first the first thing is let me i'll just ask you the direct question i was going to ask you that i had that obviously you, you sort of make it clear that you have one of the the best commission structures out there what is that so we've got a commission structure where you can take home 45% upwards of your revenue generated in total earnings. So making that clear, that's your basic salary, commission and bonus. We don't have any time parameters on that. So we don't stick four week period limitations, quarterly limitations, half year limitations. It's quite simply, if you generate the revenue, you will take home commission, take home great earnings. You know, there are not, there are very few, if any, 150K billers who earn 68K. Very, right, very so basically, depending on what you bill, you take 45%. No, so you have your basic salary right. and then you have your commission based yeah. around your basic salary. It, it is also a very fair structure. So you can look at two, two people who are sat next to each. They can look each other in the eye. If they've both built 200K, they both, both no, they've earned 94K. Right. If they've earned, written 250K, they've earned 120. Okay. So... There is a little bit of change in the early parts of the commission structure, depending on your base. But overall, when you come to the end of the year, you will have taken home 45% plus of what you've earned compared to the traditional 30, 33%. Hey everyone, a real quick one from me. This podcast would not be possible without our amazing podcast partners, Vincere and Sourcebreaker. Because you listen to this podcast, you're able to get your hands on exclusive savings on both of these award-winning products. If you're a growing recruitment business, you have to check out Vincere, who are an all-in-one operating system for your growing recruitment business. With Sourcebreaker, if you wanna make sure that all of your recruiters have the best tools on the market to stand out and beat their competition, then you have to check out Sourcebreaker. Use the link in the show notes, in the comments below, and you'll be able to get yourself exclusive savings on these amazing products. Yeah, it depends. Okay, thank you for sharing that. So then the other thing, I just want to play sort of, um, not devil's advocate, but I feel like people listening and might be wondering this, particularly leaders. So all the things that you shared there, amazing. I think kudos to you to committing to that and really living and by it. So I really understand the focus on outcomes and deliverables, totally understand that. So I guess what I wanted to ask you was like, where where's the line ultimately so like if you have someone where you've de- decided what the the a target is for the year and you check in at the the halfway point and and they're quite a way off i guess what i wanted to get your thoughts on is like how do you how do you sort of stay close to the line of like yes we're going to give them the autonomy trust that's what we're leading with uh, we're going to focus on the outcomes but what sort of things do you keep an eye on and stay close to that could potentially be markers of like this person isn't isn't quite up to where they need to be um that is going to be required to to help for them to achieve the outcome that they're after do you get what i mean so yeah. like again there might, there'll be specific activities that you might be looking out for i guess i wanted to just get your thoughts on that's great you trust them but there will be things that you're looking at and and paying close attention to because surely you're going to have to do that to be confident that these people are, are really maximizing the trust autonomy in the environment that you've built so what are some of the things that you look at and stay close to? 
Absolutely. It's really important. I think you'd be naive not to ask that question yeah. because not everything goes amazingly to plan. And I think the big, the first question to ask yourself is why? Well, I don't ask myself the question. I'll ask them why. Why Why are you where you are at the moment? Okay. What, what's, you know, what do you feel isn't quite going right? What do you feel could help and support you? But equally as much, I think the big thing for me is, is attitude. Do you know, if somebody is really championing, embracing the values, showing commitment to the business and showing that, do you know what? I appreciate that it's not quite where I need to be or where I'd like to be, but I'm working hard, I'm committed, I'm listening to you and I'm putting into place what we are trying to help you, how we're supporting you. But what are the tangibles on that? Because like that's quite, how do you, how do you, how can you record, like, do you know what I mean? How do, what are some of the, sure, are you looking at first stage interviews being booked? I don't know, well, got, there's got to be some tangibles in there that give you that confidence. Well, it depends what, what's going wrong. If, if it's, you know, a lack of vacancies. So I, be keeping in touch with that person and I'd talk them through well it's not let's not just look at vacancies get more vacancies let's actually break it down let's go beneath the service what do you need to do to get more vacancies how can we be innovative how can we think outside of the box we're challenged to get more vacancies and these are the things that I think we need to be looking at right and naturally say look like let's set your wins for a week or a period or a quarter or a half year focusing on this let's don't focus on the end goal let's move away from focusing on revenue ultimately mm. revenue is the end goal i get that but you know if you're fixated on revenue but you're not doing the right things beneath the surface let's try and get those right and what's important to me is if somebody goes away and really works hard at that and is doing the right things is coming back to me and saying well this is working that's not working you know what you're likely to help them and support them to get right. there but equally as much, if people don't have the commitment and don't have the attitude and don't embrace the values of the business, and quite frankly, they're telling you, well, I don't care. They're the people that you're having conversations of, you know, I don't think Pivot's probably the right place for you because okay. you're not going to achieve your goals and, uh, you know, your part of the jigsaw in the business isn't going to be achieved. And yeah, that's not fair on me, but that's not fair on the rest of the business. Sure. The rest of the business who are either achieving their goals, exceeding their goals, or making sure they're doing everything to get as close to their goals as possible, why should they be held back and have to ask the question, well, what's so-and-so doing in the business? And that's the important thing. You know, yes, when things don't go to plan, we put things right. We've, I've got bags of experience. I've taken so many people in the past through challenging times. You know, recruitment is notorious. It has its highs, but it has its lows. If people are willing to be supported, take that on board and actually put in the commitment, the hard work that takes you back to the highs, great. I'm all for it. But, you know, if you're just on the pivot ride for a good basic salary and uh, quite frankly, sticking two fingers up at the rest of the mm. business, you know, unfortunately, you're not right. I think, and, and that goes, that extends beyond what I look for in a consultant, it's not just revenue. You know, you could have a, a 350, 400K biller, but if they're completely disruptive and stick two fingers up yeah, at so the champion... the culture. Yeah, you know, they're, no matter what their revenue is, it's actually destructive to mm. the business. And that's probably as destructive as... You're, or in fact, more destructive than your underperformer. Yeah, you know, sure. your underperformer, if you people look at them and go... I can see they're doing it. They're more likely to pull in support from the team. You know, I'll help you. Whereas the person who doesn't care, do you know what? People will push them, push them away and go, I'm not wasting my time there. Okay, so let, I just want to frame this up for people listening because and then a couple, couple of questions. So, so how this, I know this isn't all about uh, revenue, but I think it's important for people to see how this is sort of played out. So, so I've got here, when we prepared for this, obviously year, um, end of year one, ended around the sort of 650K revenue yeah. mark because of six of you. Obviously, you're on your, uh, when's the end of your second year? September, so we've got last quarter of the year. Last now. quarter, so last quarter of the year. Um, should be finishing on eight people, you're eight people today. Yep. Yeah, and then on track to do one to 1 1.2 million turnover, yep. right? So what what I wanted to ask you is, is a couple of things just around this to, as we come to the end here. So I guess firstly, you've been really positive about it and these things. So um, the question I want to ask you first is, 
with this approach, with this intention around the type of recruitment business you want to build and the type of people you want to employ and support, what have been uh, in, the, in, in these two years, what have been the biggest challenges with that approach that maybe you under you didn't anticipate? Yeah, talk to us about some of the challenges with this because some, some people listening to this may want to approach it like this yeah. and really uh, like intend to grow a culture like this within their recruitment business but maybe have concerns or worried about certain things. So what have been some of the biggest challenges that maybe you didn't plan for? I think probably the biggest challenge that I didn't plan for is people not believing what we say we do, we deliver on. Okay. That a lot of people, when I market pivot externally to consultants, they'll ask them, ask me, well, it's too good to be true. You know, I've been earning approximately a third of what I generate in revenue and you're telling me that I can increase my earnings by 20 or 30 grand. That's a hell of a lot of money, but I don't understand it because they're fixed in the mindset of being in that business where it's profits over people. Um, and also not just the revenue side of it and the earnings side of it, but people don't believe that you can have that level of flexibility, that level of innovation, support and, and benefits. You know, as a business, we offer a lot. So I think that's probably the big one. And that's something that over time, I think will change. The more people are talking about Pivot, the more I do things like this, that suddenly people start to think, well, it must be true. And suddenly, as you get more, you know, people joining from businesses, they, they suddenly start to say, do you know what? It is true. And it happens and people start talking and there's, there's almost like a... Yeah, sure. Yeah, so obviously, yeah, that's fair. I'm not surprised by that. So people being cynical about, yeah. OK, sounds great, but is it true? But give me some in the business stuff. That's what people would find useful. I think that in the business stuff, um, obviously, I think the tough stuff is the post-COVID world that we've been in. For the, obviously the first year of the business, we were largely in lockdowns, restrictions and things like that. We went through, we became sort of very routine and structured as individuals. So we'd wake up, have our breakfast, work, lunch, work, back downstairs mm. to actually get people to really embrace and use the structure of flexibility. You have to really encourage it. You have to do it yourself to show that it's not, you know, sure. a trick. But getting people to use that. Um, but I think from a management side, which I think is sort of what you really want to know is, I think the big thing that you've had to learn is you've got to be adaptable, you've got to be flexible, but you've got to go in with a committed mindset. I do want to implement this and I am going to implement this, but not everything I do is going to work 100%. <laughs> you have to be prepared to constantly evaluate, analyze, assess, so and change don't give up on something because it didn't work first time. And the really important thing is as you're changing, it's really important to listen to your employees. They are the biggest barometer of whether something is working or not. Go to them for ideas, go to them and ask them. Don't be afraid to get criticism, but you've got to create a culture and an environment where so if people come back with critical feedback that is constructive, but not necessarily positive, you can't you know, put a mark against them, you've got to actually go, okay, I take it on board. What do you think we could do to change it? Or I think we could do this. What do you think? But you've got, don't be afraid to listen to your employees and stick to what you want to do, but change it and evolve. How, it. how do you intentionally do that? Do you use any tools or anything like that? Because it'd be, it might, it's, that it's one thing to say, yeah, you can come and speak to me about challenges, but it's a whole other thing. People having the courage to say to their boss that like, you know this thing that you keep doing, I'm, I'm not a fan of it. Like that's, do you use like tool, tools and anonymous surveys to um, get a barometer of that or? Use surveys, yeah. definitely. That's a really good thing. But a massive one is creating that openness environment where people don't feel afraid to come and talk to you about things. You know, I constantly will ask the question, are you okay with this? How are you finding things? When you're implementing change, specifically ask, how are you finding it? Some, some people say, great, it's going really well, but... I think if you create the mentality of I'm all all for you telling me that something's not working or give me negative feedback, but also throw some solutions at me. Don't be a whinger, be a, be actually somebody who is driving change. Sure. Use third party consultancies where possible, you know, use independent people. So, for example, we're about to go through a massive revamp of our um, benefits package. You know, what we offer earnings wise is amazing. What we offer in terms of flexibility, innovation, all of that's brilliant. But I want our benefits package to be amazing. I want it to be, you know, people wow again, asking how can you do that? And there are two key things that I think are important. I'm bringing in a workplace wellbeing 
and culture specialist who's going to run a session with the rest of the business and myself coming with ideas of what benefits would you like to see. Don't be afraid to bring a benefit to the table, but using people to say, do you know what? I want an outsider's opinion because yeah, ultimately as a leader, you live in a box. Yeah. You know, the way you evolve and progress, you've got to be willing to let people in from the outside and take take on board what they say. They may things may say things that you don't you, you hadn't thought off you a different perspective, but sometimes they then explain it and it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Mm. So I guess as as we come to the end here, there's a couple of things. So you, we've spoken a lot about how this could probably help you grow your business and, and hire people. But I guess how how has this approach and this intention around the business that you want to build actually manifested in with your customers, with your candidates? Like, has, have you also found that obviously you, your intention was to be a genuine, different employer? But has that actually ended up then manifesting in the companies that you speak to? Um, I don't know. And have you have you found that they've gone? You know what, um, Kaz, this is actually a really interesting approach. We like. I don't know. I'm just interested if this has also impacted the commercials of like winning customers and those things if they've resonated with what you're trying to build i don't know how, how's that played out absolutely i think from a customer perspective um a some customers are interested they'll ask why are you different you know they'll look look at the website and go it's quite different like how are you different and they are interested in the fact that we are booking the trend and we're, and sometimes it aligns with what our clients do we work with some clients who themselves are trying to book the trend in the industry be leaders be be entrepreneurial and they, they're interested like we want to partner with a business like you that's also reflected in our suppliers that we partner with that they're like we want to work with you you know you're actually one of our smaller businesses but we're really bought into you and we're not going to treat you as a small business client we're actually going to treat you as, as an enterprise client or an SME client because do you know what you're not afraid to try different things you're not afraid to push us to the limits in terms of what you can offer but I think our clients have also seen a benefit um, in the sense that the employees, the consultants in the business enjoy working for the business because they've got a better work-life balance. They, you know, they talk about the fact that, you know, they were doing things they enjoy. They're encouraged to do things they enjoy at any time in the day. It really doesn't matter. They're happier. So they're more motivated when they actually are working. And that's reflected in the delivery. You know, we are delivering solutions faster and better to our clients and also the clients are really benefiting from the innovation. Um, we've had really, really positive feedback in terms of how we've integrated video tech innovatively. And I'm not talking about, we offer you a, a Zoom room to do your interviews. We've been doing that for years since COVID started, but using video tech to engage with our candidates, our clients, using video tech to add value to interview processes to make them more streamlined, more effective. Client feedback's been phenomenal you know is really cool you know when you've got a vp of a major international oil and gas business saying that was really cool and different because i'd sent a video message to engage with him i'd utilize video in various parts of an in well an assignment and they're telling it's cool they like it they're seeing the benefits we're seeing you know everybody's suffering from candidate scarcity at the moment and we are trying to reach out to candidates in different ways using tech and it's working, you know, we're not reliant purely on LinkedIn like a lot of recruiters. We've had candidates engage with us and they've said, why have you engaged with us? Well, I'm tired of just getting LinkedIn messages, but I got I got this from you and it made me curious and I wanted to reach out to you, so I did. So it's definitely not just internal benefits that we're seeing from the way that we work and we're doing things. Ultimately, we're seeing external benefits where our clients, our candidates, our companies we partner are benefiting. and. Overall, what that means is actually the consultants who are joining us are doing better than they were in their old place, but they're not working harder, longer hours. And that's the reason why. It's actually because we're innovating, we're investing in them, and they're reaping the benefits of that. Kaz, look, I think, um, look, kudos to you to really commit into this. I think it could be very easy to go back to your old ways, <laughs> right? Or just go back to the environment that you've known for however many years. So, yeah, definitely just want to say kudos to you to really commit into that. And, and I generally feel like hopefully like more and more uh, recruitment companies can build environments like this, where like you said, they, they really put as much investment as they do in their people as they do into uh, growing the bottom line. So thank you so much for joining me. 
I really appreciate it. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Really enjoyed being here and really enjoyed the opportunity of uh, chatting with you, Hashem. Thank you so much for listening to the episode. I hope you enjoyed it and got value from the conversation. If you did enjoy it, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe and we'll see you in the next episode.